screen. First Timothy chapter 2. You know, this church is built on prayer. This church is built on prayer. And the Lord's church has always been built on prayer. And his plan for the end time is no different. So here we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. The Bible says that Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, I exhort therefore, meaning at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is talking to Timothy about the great promises and prophecies that are upon him, upon Timothy. And because of the prophecies, Timothy had a responsibility to pray. Okay? Because of the prophecies. Not, not because of the prayer he was going to receive prophecies. But because of the prophecies he needed to pray. All right? This is the context of this verse here. So... Paul says, I exhort, therefore, because of the prophecies that are upon you, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, somebody say supplications. Let's say prayers. Let's say intercessions. And giving of thanks. Giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings, somebody say, for all men. <laughs> you have to pray for that person that irritates you. Praise God. <laughs> Verse 2, for kings. That includes President Biden and Vice President Harris. Amen. Hallelujah. We could finish Connect tonight. You're dismissed. <laughs> And for all that are in authority, that why? Not because you like them, not because you voted for them, not because you praise them, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Wow, that's a lot there. Praise God. Let's pray one more time. Jesus, thank you for your word and your spirit. Speak to us. Lord, let your experience uh, of who you are and just the life of Jesus be manifested here tonight in and through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's a challenge in itself. You have a whole lot to swallow. But... A few months ago, probably about a month ago or six weeks, I had the responsibility during service to uh, do the time of prayer for our needs. And I shared that the Lord had given me a vision of a submarine sitting over the sanctuary. And the Lord gave me these two things regarding what submarines are for. They are for, somebody say, discovery and warfare. So submarines, uh, I remember one time my wife and I went to a museum. She was having the time of her life making fun of me, <laughs> fit through a maybe two and a half foot, three foot hole that went down into a submarine. And I was the only person over 18 in that line. <laughs> uh, she has videos. Don't ask her. And, you know, submarines are quite the invention. In fact, the United States of America, which we are thankful for, we're not proud of, we're thankful for. Amen. Praise God. Uh, the United States of America has one of the most elite military forces in all the world. And our submarine fleet is quite intimidating. Currently, the most advanced submarine fleet right now 
is named after O-H. I-O. You'll probably never catch me doing that ever again. <laughs> but it's named after the state of Ohio. It's called the Ohio Class. There's 18 different submarines. 14 of them particularly have to do with uh, housing nuclear weapons. In fact, a lot of people think that nuclear weapons come out of the ground somewhere in the middle of the desert. Uh, but about 50% of our nuclear warheads are on boats, submarines more specifically, right now. Almost half. And these submarines are quite impressive. In fact, uh, if I told you all the statistics about them, we would sound smart but have no idea what we're talking about. But one submarine can house over 200 warheads. One warhead is more powerful than 30 Hiroshima bombings. So one submarine can cause over just about 60,000, I'm sorry, or 6,000 Hiroshima's by itself. America. <laughs> but, you know, the, as I was investigating this, it's very interesting what we can get caught up in the natural and miss out what God's trying to tell us in the supernatural. Because it's very apparent that our, our, our country is in decay. It's in decay because of sin. It comes down to that. But there is a power that is not in decay. There is a power that's being set up in the spirit that is ever increasing in fact, the Lord said in, to Isaiah that the increase of his government shall have no end. There is a government that's not decaying in this world. There's a lot of talk about nuclear war. But there's a, there's a lot of talk amongst the angels about another kind of war. And God has put nuclear warheads spiritually in his church by way of intercessory prayer. We do it, but we don't often talk about it because it kind of just happens. And we don't often investigate, evaluate, inquire of what happened when we do engage in intercessory prayer. In fact, it's one of those things that uh, makes guests and people that are not aware of a lot of spiritual things uh, think we're bananas. <laughs> but intercessory prayer is the spiritual nuclear warhead that the adversary is scared of. And it's not a mistake. I really don't think it's a mistake that the current most deadly class of submarines that's present right now is called the Ohio class. I have much faith that there are intercessors in this congregation that make up the most deadly fleet in the entire world of what intercessory prayer looks like. And the Lord is wanting to not just restore, but instate new people to that fleet. And one of the amazing, amazing things about submarines is that they go under the radar. <laughs> oh, praise God. You know, I actually uh, considered asking Pastor Jimmy for this to not be live streamed because of the fact that this would go into, um, could I say, the airwaves. 
But the Lord was reminding me that what he's going to do through his people is going to be under the radar. And while we do have great times of intercessory prayer in our services, there's a lot that God wants to do in our homes. There's a man in our church who was driving, and I'm not disclosing him because I heard the story in private, so I'm wanting to respect his privacy. But he was driving by the, the home of a family in this church, and when he drove by their front yard, he saw a vision of two devils that were wrestling on the front, in the front yard. And the Lord spoke to him that those two devils were wrestling in the front yard because they were scared to go into the home. And whoever lost had to go in. And the Lord spoke to him, this man in our church, and told him that the, that the devils were wrestling over the fact that they knew an, a woman intercessor lived in that home. You know, the book of Ezekiel talks about how Ezekiel saw a vision of a man that was clothed in linen and he had an ink horn. He had a container where he was holding some ink. And the Lord spoke to that angel and said, go about the whole city. And whoever lets out a cry regarding the abominations that are going on in the midst of Israel, put a mark on his forehead. And then the Lord spoke to another angel and said, whoever does not have a mark on his forehead, kill him. That's pretty serious. Intercession marks you. When you give yourself to intercessory prayer, the angels can identify you. They know who intercedes, and they know who doesn't intercede. They know who not only has a prayer life, but has a life of prayer. And those are two very different things. I remember I heard it said once, You can have an altar where you pray at, but do you have an altar where you die at? And the supernatural beings know these things. But intercessory prayer has marked this church distinct from others. It's not an accident. This man yesterday who got in contact with our church because this church has been identified in the spirit to be a church of intercessory prayer. It marks us. But the thing about intercessory prayer is that we do get instruction from the Bible as to what it is and what it looks like and how it can be manifested. So in the New Testament, there's two words for intercession. I'm not going to try to pronounce them, but there's two words for intercession. One of them is a falling in with, is what it translates to, and another one means to encounter or collide with. So the first one is a falling in with. In the Greek, it actually gives the picture of somebody coming to where you are. And the second word for intercession translates more for when you come in collision or in conflict with something. So one is where something else is joining you where you are. And another one is something else is colliding against you or you're colliding against it where you are. That's very important. Because in intercession, you will have times where the Lord is joining you where you are to carry the burden that's upon you. And in other times of intercession, the Lord is empowering you to go into conflict with the adversary. Those are two very distinct Forms of intercession that we must be aware of so that we know what is happening. 
See, because we can think that we're in conflict with something when God is really trying to birth something. You don't see people fighting in the NICU section of a hospital unless it's new parents finding out their first argument as parents. <laughs> but you don't see much of this battle against people and, you know, when babies are being born. But you do on the battlefield. You don't want to be fighting when you're supposed to be birthing something. And you don't want to be in labor when you're supposed to be fighting something. Amen. So it's important to recognize what God is doing when we enter intercessory prayer. Now, intercessory prayer is not always loud. Mm. That's church culture that tells us that intercessory prayer, we need to be screaming at the top of our lungs when we're doing it. In fact, some of the deepest moves of God that I've ever been in have been low volume. I remember one time I was doing, I was doing an all-night prayer meeting, and uh, it was about 2.30 in the morning, and I'm almost collapsed on the couch from how tired I am. And I'm uh, trying to stay awake by the mercies of God. And all of a sudden, I hear from downstairs, unreal. But our neighbors started playing this super loud movie at 2.30 in the morning. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you watching at 2.30 in the morning? It was causing the floor to shake. And I'm concerned she's going to wake up and then prayer meeting is going to be over. Because I'm not, just because I'm wanting to serve her and make sure and I have to go downstairs and tell them what are you guys doing and all this stuff, but. Then the Lord stopped me and says, exercise authority. Well, it's 2.30 in the morning. I feel she needs to be sleeping. And I'm not trying to get into this volume competition. See, the devil's always wanting to make sure he can disturb your peace. Because if he can disturb your peace, he knows he has some authority in your life. Amen. So I began to inquire of God, what do you want me to do? But this holy anger got on me. And as best as I can replic replicate what happened in that moment, this is all I could think of doing, but I had a whole lot of faith. I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I come in. I'm telling you what, just a few seconds passed and that TV turned off. But, amen. We have authority not because of our volume, but because of our submission. And when we submit ourselves in the proper alignment, family alignment, church alignment, brotherly alignment, sisterly alignment. When we have that submission going on, there is a degree and demonstration of power and authority that will come to your intercessory prayer that would not be there unless you were submitted. You could whisper and devils would go fleeing from you. You could speak without lifting your voice and devils would go disturbed, not wanting to come back. Now, there's a time and place for lifting our voice and exercising authority in that fashion. But it's not always the case. This is why, oh, I'm, I'm just going to say this, Sister, Sister Yubo, I saw you praying. Uh, this was... Saturday night, no, Sunday morning in prayer. I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. But when Brother Scott Ferguson started talking about 
being intense. When I saw you pray with intensity, I shook. Because intensity is not about volume. It's about focus. We need to remember that intensity is not about volume. It's about focus. And if volume comes, let volume come. This is important regarding intercessory prayer because, because the devil will try to pick a fight with you to try to get you out of the focus that intercessory prayer requires and get you distracted with thinking that you have to make a lot of noise to get something done in the spirit. But intercessory prayer is a supernatural thing and therefore we can't measure and gauge it and judge it and grade it based off of the natural things. That's very important. And so in intercessory prayer, we pray in the Spirit. We pray in unknown languages. That's why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is very important because we begin to speak with other tongues the first time we're baptized in the Spirit. And God is giving us a doorway and an access point for us to pray in the Spirit and exercise intercessory prayer. You can't intercede in English or any other native language you may know, but, but the book of Romans chapter 8 says that we don't know how to pray for as we ought to. So God has given us the Spirit to make intercession for us according to the will of God with groanings and utterings that we cannot basically express on our own. So he's given us the spirit to make and achieve a greater layer of intercession. We're going somewhere tonight. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, the context is love, but he reveals a secret. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men, thank you, awesome media team, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. I neglected to do this. I'm sorry, media team, but I was watching a clip the other day of Brother Eli Hernandez, who was ministering here a few years ago, and he ministered on the subject called a Victory Before Your Fight. If you remember that message, just testify that you remember that message. Praise God. He was ministering in that message, and in that message towards the end, he gives a prophecy about two angels that would go out into the city. And then he proceeds to pray that those angels would be sent out and then something unnatural happens. He begins to expressly but distinctly speak with other tongues. And it was, you, you could... Savannah was watching it, not even in the same room, if I'm not mistaken. And she testified of it later how each time she heard him speak with tongues like that, she just felt it shiver around her whole body. But you could tell that what he was saying was not a normal man tongue. He was speaking with the tongues of angels. Why does God give us the ability to speak with tongues of angels? You ever wonder that? If you haven't, I have. And here's the answer the Lord gave me. He gave it in a form of a question. Don't you just love it when he asks you a question after you ask him a question? He's clever. That's an understatement. But he asked me and said, well, do you remember how the angels, they gather before me in my presence, just like in the book of Job? Yes. How do you think they get shortcuts to my word? You have the answer. <laughs> when the people of God speak with other tongues. You think angels always have the time regarding the will of God? And to achieve the will of God, always have the time to go back to that heavenly place where they have their rendezvous. Angels are fast and powerful. 
But there are some reasons why angels know when you pray and they gather your tears when you offer them up unto God. Why do they come to you? They're not just gathering your prayers. They're gathering his orders. Why do you think we just have, we, we have angelic manifestations in our church? Not just because they're trying to hang out. They're trying to get some orders. And see, this is why when you, when you feel an angelic manifestation, which could be, could be goosebumps, could be, it's not always, but it could be. And you feel the unction and the desire and all of a sudden this impulse to want to start praying in the spirit. Why is that? God, by his spirit, knows he's trying to prompt you to give some orders. Ah. This is why Paul could say, I pray in tongues more than you all. Because Paul was always ready to impart to that angel of the Lord that encamped round about him some orders regarding what Paul didn't know in his natural mind, but the spirit knew what was coming. And it would behoove us that we would pray in the Spirit more often. That the angel of the Lord that encamps round about us, encamps round about our homes, encamps round about our jobs, to know what to do so that they don't have to leave us and go back to the Lord's rendezvous spot in heavenly places and know what to do on the spot. These are secrets of intercessory prayer that are going to take us to the next level of achieving God's will and going under the radar. Oh, God is so amazing. But we don't just speak with the tongues of angels. The Bible talks about how Paul, he travailed that Christ may be formed in the church. We read about it in the Old Testament, in fact, through the life of Jeremiah, Hosea, Ezekiel. We read about a particular manifestation of intercession called travail. Let's say travail. Travail. We are not strangers to travail in this church. But travail, what is travail associated with? It's associated with a new birth. And we ought not to be fighting when we're supposed to be birthing, right? And so travail is a manifestation of how intercession can come to us. And travail is there is the deep, deep pit that comes upon it's our innermost being. And you almost get into this wailing like a woman would when she's birthing. And when God releases upon you a moment of travail, you can therefore have expectation of something being birthed. Even if you never see it. I was just talking to a friend of mine this past weekend. And he told me about a story how back in 2017, he had gone into, he had an unction of intercessory prayer come upon him. And for two weeks, daily, on and off, a spirit of strong intercession came upon him. Two weeks, on and off. And this word kept coming out when he heard himself speak in tongues. That he didn't recognize, of course, but it was racha. Now that might sound normal to you because we don't really know what we're saying, right? But the thing is, after two weeks, he started talking to somebody, and they said that they saw on the news that ISIS had lost control of a city called Raqqa. And in that city, they were persecuting Christians. And he said that the same day he found that out, earlier that day, there had been a lift that came off of him that he knew it wasn't going to come back. Your prayers don't just affect your family. They affect nations. We know this as a church where people have been delivered from jail because of our prayers. It's not arrogant to say we prayed and that happened. That's faith. 
But we won't always know the result of what our intercession is. That's the test. That's the test. Well, I got to go do this. Do you really? Well, I feel like I need to go do this. Do I really need to? It's very distinct. See, God, God is so jealous regarding the moment where he is inviting us into intercession. He'll make sure you know what you are giving up. He's not just going to make you feel a little bit and then, all, oh, surprise, it was, it was much more than you thought, even though it always is much more than we think. But he won't let you just slip by and miss out on a great opportunity in the spirit because he loves us that much to be merciful, to want to invite us into partnership with him regarding intercessory prayer. But travail is one of those things that we don't always know what's going to happen as a result of those prayers. See, each and every single one of us were a result of somebody's travail. Every single one of us is a result of somebody somewhere interceded and travailed for you to be born of water and spirit and for, somebody, and for me to be born of water and spirit. That's something to think about. But travail is not the only thing. See, travail comes with the Bible calls pangs. Pangs. It's this almost like a sheer moment of intercession where it's it like something hits you, a strong labor pain. But the thing about pangs is that word translates into three different things. One of them is not just this utter cry. Oh, brother Jim Johnson, you're going to love this. The word pangs also translates to the hinge of a door. You know why some doors have not opened in your life? You have not yet engaged in travail for that door to unhinge. You know why some prophecies, Paul told Timothy, some prophecies have not yet fully manifested. We have not yet travailed to the degree where that prophecy has come to be fully birthed. See, you can have a door. It's great to have a door. But if it's closed and it's not going to open, it doesn't make a difference. You're not going anywhere. But it tra travail particularly causes that door to open. Now, Paul said in Ephesus, there's a great and what? Effectual door. He said, open before me, if you read in one of the translations. But there's what? Many adversaries. See, Paul had done the travail for the door to be open, but he had not yet done the warfare in intercession for those enemies to be cleared out of the way. Do you think there's devils that want to mess with this church? It's a big, fat No. I'm not scared to say that. And neither should you be scared to say big fat no. But there's travail that also has to be done to achieve God's full purpose. But warfare is necessary. So there's warfare tongues. This church is no stranger to warfare tongues. <laughs> but the thing about the spirit of intercession is that God, the Old Testament reveals, has a soul too. You can do that on your own time of study. But the Spirit of God comes with God's emotions many times. And when a warfare tongue comes upon you, you may just get really angry. You might just get very passionate. You might just get very aggressive. And one of the things about why God shares with us that channel of his emotions is because he's wanting to let you know that he cares about it just as much and more than you do. He's got emotions about where you're at, what you're facing, and what gets in your way as well. 
Just because he's spirit doesn't mean he doesn't feel things from time to time regarding your soul and where you're at and what you face. That fatigue, that tiredness, that cynicism, God cares about that. He's got feelings about that. But when you get into a warfare tongue, you might just get very angry. I've seen it manifest in this church many times with many of you. And you know what? That frustration that God lets you have when you walk into the sanctuary and God lets it sit on you, sometimes you need to channel that frustration as a warfare tongue against the adversary and just show him, don't mess with me. You know why sometimes you're just wondering, why, won't I, why can't I shake off this anger and frustration? Have you tried a warfare tongue lately? Oh, I just felt the devil get stirred up. Scared, not scared. Have you tried a warfare tongue lately? Because you've got to clear the adversary if you're going to walk through that door. And you've got to also travail for that door to be open. See, church, we're not just going to, we're not just here to slip on by and have some great church and things have been happening. But God is wanting to give his people strategies that are going to be achieved under the radar. And you're going to get in a spot in your home. And you're going to feel the spirit of intercession come on you. And God's going to take you and give you more clarity regarding that experience than you've ever had before. Because God's wanting to be able to partner with his people at any moment to achieve his will. You know how that man came to this church? Somebody was interceding for him. Somebody was in travail. Somebody was, was in warfare for that family to not be obstructed and be exposed to this apostolic doctrine that we teach and preach here. Somebody was doing it. Somebody. And we probably might not ever know who that was. But that's the point. Because if we don't always know who it is, then God gets the glory and we don't. That's the test. But the thing about intercessory prayer as well is that it's such a deep place in prayer that God will start to reveal things to you that you can't know by any other means. So here it is. You know what's one of the things that intercessors deal with many times? This is going to come right for all of us. Cynicism. Cynicism and judgmentalism. And you feel tempted to be justified when you become a very strong intercessor. To be judgmental about other people because you're having a deep experience in prayer. But other people are not giving themselves to it. And you start to identify by the Spirit of God. Because you went into intercession about some things that that person might be dealing with. It's quiet. But it's true. But that's a test. See, Jeremiah was told of the Lord, and Jeremiah was given to say, if they be prophets, let them now make intercession. You know, there's a lot of people that got supposedly a prophetic word, but they don't have the intercession to back it up. What does intercession do? It purifies that which we see about others. Intercession purifies that which we see about others. It's easy to stay judgmental when we don't give ourselves to intercession and then give it back to God when we discover things about other people. Cynicism is one of the symptoms of an unhealthy intercessor. Judgmentalism is another symptom of an unhealthy intercessor. But a healthy intercessor knows how to have a joy. Say joy. Joy. Joy is more specifically expectation of good things. So when you discover that particular thing about that person because you went intercessor, into intercessory prayer, but you went to prayer and God didn't give you direction to talk to them, that's two different things. You need to have joy regarding what God has revealed you. 
reveal to you. Because if you don't have joy, you'll become judgmental. I know it's true. Amen. Personal experience. Amen. Number two, another unhealthy sign of an another sign of an unhealthy intercessor. You're restless. You're restless. Because the things that you become aware of by intercessory prayer, you want to know where they're going and what's going to happen. You're restless. And when you're restless, you also become impatient. If you're an intercessor and you're impatient, you're not healthy. You're not healthy. One of the most important things that many intercessors are reluctant about is rest. <laughs> it's rest. Because we want to go back. And sometimes intercessory prayer is the only safe place that we know because of the calamity in our lives. A woman of God came up to me one time. And Pastor Jimmy finished six minutes earlier last week, so I get those six minutes tonight. <laughs> I'm joking. Not. Uh, she came up to me and she stopped me. Uh, she stopped me. She told me, long story short, if I said her name, you would know her. She's a great woman of God, powerful woman of God. But she stopped me. She said, I, I need to share with you a story. I said, okay. She said, in my, in, she had a dream. In the dream, I was telling you this story. That of a real woman that I was working with. And she was a powerful intercessor. But she picked up every burden that she felt in the spirit. You know not every burden is for you to pray? You know not every burden is for you to pray? Because if you don't have grace for it, you won't have the strength to go through it. And then you'll subject yourself to a time of intercessory prayer for an energy that you were supposed to give to your family. It's trial and error many times. <laughs> but this is wisdom. And he, she was telling me this story. This intercessor picked up every burden she could feel. And it got increasingly burdensome, the kinds of things that she began to intercede for. Long story short, one day the, her family, that, that woman's family, was going to vacation. And just down the road, this woman of God is telling me this story, and just down the road, this family was headed to their vacation spot. This woman starts to intercede in the front seat of the car. But it was very unusual. And she began to intercede on such a deep level, she was no longer responding to her husband. It's a test when you need to respond to authority when you think you're going deep. Amen. And she went deeper and deeper and deeper. And then all of a sudden, she started screaming in pain. And her husband rushes her to the hospital. And she keeps interceding. And her organs start collapsing. And her body was never the same because she did not let the burden go. See, in these last days, Calvary, God is going to make us so powerful and wise to achieve those things of the Spirit that we're not just going to achieve mighty and powerful things and reaching thousands and millions. But God is going to give us healthy families. God's going to give us healthy marriages. And God's going to give us peace. Because when we're restless as intercessors, we don't want to rest. And it's important to rest. Let's stand. Another sign of an unhealthy intercessor. I have it somewhere here, praise God. 
all these papers. Hallelujah. I should just ask the Lord what it was, not get all messy up here. Is depression what you think is depression? You're unhealthy if you think you're depressed. Because you're letting God's emotion and you're labeling, your, you're labeling it your emotion. And his emotion is not depression. That's a state of being, not an emotion. It's very different. But intercessors that deal with depression or what they think is depression need to learn how to laugh. Laughter is a sign of a healthy intercessor. Just think about it. You know you've seen them. Intercessors that they're powerfully used, but then they don't want to talk to anybody. Leave me alone. We want to get like that sometimes. Laughter is important. It'll keep you healthy as an intercessor. Amen. Let's lift our hands. Thank you, Jesus, for your word and spirit, God. Thank you for the instruction of your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because you're wanting to equip us further as intercessors, God, because this church was not just built on intercession, Father. It will go forth by intercession. Give us wisdom, Lord. You said, he that lacketh wisdom, let him ask. God, we ask of wisdom from your spirit that we may be more effective intercessors, God, because we've got needs in our families. We have needs in our communities, needs in this city. We have needs, Father, but they are going to be met and served through the power of intercession. God, backsliders are going to be prayed back through because somebody was interceding. Somebody was in travail. Somebody was in warfare against the devils that were keeping that backslider, Father, in bondage. Come on, church, let's pray. Let's pray. If there's a need, a burden that has come to your heart and mind and spirit, let's exercise some intercession in this moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's just exercise some lingering in his presence, just a few moments.
you know, it's in the lingering. It's in the lingering that we learn how much he really loves us. It's in the lingering that we learn how much he really loves us. Because he's not there just to hear some English come out of my mouth. He comes because he wants to fellowship. Let's remember that this week, he wants to fellowship. And when somebody gets intimate with you in fellowship, they get really open with you. They show you their heart. God wants to show us his heart. Father, thank you for your word and spirit. I pray, Father, that there would be a empowerment of grace to strengthen us. Give us the ability to not just hear the word, but be doers of the word. That we may give ourselves, Father, to supplications, to prayers, to intercessions, to giving of thanks for all men, for kings, for all those that are in authority, that your will may be achieved in the earth and we may live a quiet and peaceable life. In the name of Jesus. Let's say that in the name of Jesus. Heaven's going to be great. Heaven's going to be great. Let's make plans to be there, praise God. <laughs> You're dismissed in the name of Jesus. There's fellowship with cookies and coffee. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us for the service today. I trust that what you've heard and what you've felt makes a lasting impression on your life and brings blessing to your family. Please check out our social media and uh, I look forward to seeing you again right here in Jesus' name.